Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Patrice Kelch and uh, I'm going to be offering tonight's practice. Um, Shelley is in transit and uh, so asked me if I'd be willing to do this and I'm I'm happy to. For those of you who got the email and were expecting Shelley, I apologize and uh, hope that this will be helpful to you nonetheless. So we're going to begin with our half an hour or so of sitting. And I would just really like to encourage you to see if you can just um, offer yourself an attitude of kindness in this uh, in this sit. So often, when we do our practice, it's like we take on a task, another thing that we have to get right that we need to accomplish. And so, let's see if we can, throughout the evening, uh, beginning with our practice, just come to come to it with this just attitude of kindliness and acceptance, um, curiosity. Um, Sebene Selassie, who is a teacher that Shelley's been talking about a little bit because she wrote a wonderful book called You Belong that I'm currently reading. Um, she said that she thinks it's really helpful when we <coughs> think about our practice as mindfulness to recast that in a way to an embodied awareness. So just kindly being with this mind body this evening. And I like to think of this as really resting in awareness. So I'll uh, ring a bell to start and to stop and do a little guiding, but let's see if we can, uh, if we can be together without this, uh, sense of the taskmaster and the practice as something that we, we need to do, that we need to be productive with. And instead to think of this as just an opportunity to rest in in awareness and in kindness. We just settle into the body and allow it to be. Years ago, Mark Nunberg, our guiding teacher, used to say, greet the body like you greet an old and trusted friend. And so if we can sit with a sense of friendliness toward this body, this mind, and let yourself Feel welcomed in your sitting. Welcome to taking your place on this planet, in this community, the community of humans and four-leggeds and the winged. 
folks feeling welcome to be part of this earth and resting in this loving awareness with how things have come to be in this moment. You can let the mind be with the body. In this present moment, just noticing what's there to be noticed. The pressure of your hands. The uprightness of the torso. And just bringing this kindly, friendly awareness to the body. And we can bring this friendliness to the mind if it's racing or it's busy. Just this kindly friendliness.
And we may know how to do a little self-soothing of the mind. Just helping it settle. Giving it lots of space and kindness. Gently directing it to body sensations or to the breath, but very gently. And I've sometimes found it supportive to note accepting on the in-breath, letting go on the out-breath. But these aren't really directives. This is just observing how it is naturally. We accept on the in-breath. We let go on the out breath. Very natural. Just noting how things are. And that this is the rhythm of our lives. Accepting and letting go.
And for the last five minutes or so of our meditation tonight, see if you can bring to mind, to heart, a feeling of gratitude. And just see how that sits in your embodied awareness. Call to mind something that you are grateful for. It can be something really as simple as the beautiful day that we just had today. Just notice how it is to be aware of gratitude. You can have gratitude (coughs) that you are able to follow through on your intention to be here this evening. And so often we have really good intentions and life just kind of gets in the way. So you can really experiment with a sense of gratitude that you are able to follow through with this intention to care for yourself and in caring for yourself, care for others. Some psychologists say that gratitude is the single most effective intervention for a sense of well-being. And I just find it a really good way to end a formal meditation period.
Welcome everyone. Is there anyone here for the first time tonight? And if you can put on your visuals for at least a few minutes, we can all just greet each other. Nice to see everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm going to continue uh, with some reflections uh, based on the book that Shelley's been working through in these uh, these evenings. The book by uh, Kitty Sorrow and Tanisara, the Listening to the Heart, a con- contemplative journey toward engaged Buddhism, and um, Gabe usually puts the chapter that we're reading in the, excuse me, in the blog on the website. So if you're interested, you can, can find it there, but it's a, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And the, the title of the chapter that we've been looking at is, um, the grit that uh, turns into uh, a pearl, the grit that becomes a pearl. And the grit is um, what's called in Pali, which was the original language that the Buddhist texts were written in, it's dukkha. And uh, dukkha is one of the three characteristics of existence. It's um, it's the unsatisfactory nature of our experience. And the other two characteristics are anicca or impermanence, which is the changing nature of experience, and anatta, which is the impersonal nature of all phenomenal uh, experience, sometimes called not self. And what I want to say about these three characteristics is that the task of insight, the task of of our practice over time, although I know in the beginning I said we're not thinking of this as a task, but sort of the job of the long term task of insight is to see for ourselves these three characteristics through our mindfulness experience, through our experience of embodied awareness. So these aren't characteristics or ideas that you sort of have to take on on faith or (coughs) um, commit to in any sort of intellectual way, because the whole idea is what do we learn through our own experience about about life, about our lived experience. And we learn that there is this uh, sense of dissatisfaction, that we learn that there is sort of a radical impermanence to all things, both on a micro and macro scale. And that we learn over time, and this is probably the most subtle, that um, so many things that happen and seem to happen to us are really impersonal. They're not self. Uh, sometimes we talk about our our practice of insight, the pasna practice, as seeing things clearly, which is often the most common uh, translation. But a better understanding of that is seeing how things have come to be. Seeing how things have come to be, which is in our insight practice, we experience whatever it is. We see how things are and we have an understanding 
that they're not just random or spontaneous, but we have this understanding that there have been these kinds of causes and conditions that have led to this, that this is sort of a very um, rational, lawful um, result of all these these causes and conditions. And we talk about that sometimes using the word karma, that this is the action that comes out of all these other other actions. So I want to spend a little time tonight talking more (coughs) about this term dukkha, uh, because I think it's not only so fundamental, but the many ways that it can be understood and appreciated um, are really uh, rich in in insights. Um, And you may remember that the Buddha's own path to awakening was motivated by this idea of there's this experience of suffering and human beings seem to suffer so tremendously and what can be done to alleviate suffering. So this is really sort of the the motivation for um, the whole Buddhist, the, the trajectory of the historical Buddha. So the Pali word, uh, dukkha, has many interpretations. And in this chapter, Tanisara, who is the author of this particular chapter of this book, she notes that the du, the du in dukkha, which is d-u-k-k-h-a, means apart from, that that sort of a fragment of the word means apart from, and that the k-h-a part is derived from A-K-A-S-H, which means space. So one of the ways that she looks at dukkha is that this suggests the deepest anguish and the dilemma of the self is this state of separation. That in the very word dukkha, we have this this sense of, of space and apart from, and if we look at sort of the etymology of, of dukkha, there's a a sense of the sort of suffering in this kind of separation. And I I don't, I, I know some Pali words, but I don't know Pali, not a Pali scholar, not a Pali translator, but I've been told by people who do know Pali that etymologically there's another kind of interpretation of dukkha and it's understanding that the do, the part that, uh, you know, can mean sort of apart from, is also kind of a signifier of something that's negative. And that the ka can be related to the word for the hub of a wheel. So in this way, and that's sort of, you know, the hub of the wheel is the space that the axle would occupy. So etymologically, dukkha suggests what happens when the wheel is not in alignment with the axle, okay, that there's this sort of, clunking that that it's not functional when the wheel is not in alignment with the axle and i've really found it helpful throughout my practice to think of dukkha as what happens when our perceptions or our understandings are out of alignment with the way things have come to be does that make sense it's when our our own perceptions our own understandings are kind of rubbing up against reality. They're out of alignment with how things have come to be. And that's when we really, we really suffer. Um, I also want to note this again, sort of the richness of this word that my uh, teacher and, and friend and Pali scholar, Pali translator, Santi Caro, um, some of you may have known because he's, teaches in Wisconsin as a uh, sort of um, a retreat in Wisconsin and uh, comes to Common Ground once a year, that he talks about dukkha as that which is difficult to bear. And again, this sort of harkens back to the notion of kind of a load-bearing vehicle 
difficult to bear and also what is difficult for us to accept or or carry. Um, dukkha also gets translated as that which is stressful, and that's um, uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, who's a very prominent translator, uh, translates dukkha that way. Uh, some people also talk about it as dis-ease, particularly when it's um, compared to sukha, which means sweet or easeful. So this is a really rich term that gets you know, translated as suffering mostly, but there are just so many um, nuances to this and ways of, of thinking about it that are really helpful because what we do want to understand is our own, our own suffering, our own experience with dukkha. So, you know, it can be both, you know, catastrophic tragedy and um, the, you know, the irritation of a hangnail. That's a, a kind of little dukkha. Um, and it's really important for us to kind of have an intention to notice the dukkha in our lives to really pay attention to when we have this sense that we're not in alignment with something, that there's something, something wrong, something not right, that something is troubling us that, uh, and this is where we get this uh, image from the Japanese, you know, sort of the, the grit that becomes a pearl, that we notice the irritation and we really bring our attention to it. Um, and I'm going to read a section from the book where Tanisara talks about her own experience uh, with, um, with Dukkha. If you've got the book, it's on page 101. But she says, the art of meditation is to meet Dukkha directly, to breathe with it, and to inquire into it. This is ultimately less painful than avoiding it. I remember as a young nun, I suffered a lot. I trained in a male monastery. My, I'm sorry. I trained in a male monastic hierarchy, deeply ambivalent about the presence of nuns. Initially, I didn't see the impact. But as time went on, I noticed it generated a painful and divisive power dynamic. I was grateful to live as a monastic, but the fine line between training and the blunt use of power was unhealthy, particularly when as nuns we had no agency in the decisions that shaped our lives. However, there wasn't much that I could do about the situation. Basically, it was just a lot of suffering. One day, I was contemplating the pain in my heart due to some new rules that had been handed down without consultation that I found churlish. I was just right there, holding attention to the cessation, to the sensation. It felt like a knife through my chest and a hand around my throat. It was very visceral. And although the trigger was a controlling hierarchy, the feeling felt ancient. It was the familiar pain of powerlessness. In the middle of my walking meditations, I stopped and stretched out my arms like Christ on the cross and screamed out, I accept this suffering. It sounds dramatic and somewhat inflated, and fortunately, I was well hidden in the monastery forest. But something profound happened. I realized I could be with a painful dynamic and not suffer. My suffering was there <coughs> because I didn't want things the way they were. In my acceptance, the suffering turned to compassion. 
I felt compassion for the monks and for the nuns, for myself, for everything and everyone. Meeting experience as it is empowers. We may not be able to change a challenging situation, but we can be better resourced to engage with it. This really reminded me of what <clears throat> um, James Baldwin said about, you know, not everything that's faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And there's a really subtle but important uh, distinction to make here. And Tanisara <clears throat> didn't simply see herself, <clears throat> I'm sorry, as a victim of the patriarchal and powerful monks who placed restrictions on the nuns without consultation or consent. She saw herself embedded in the whole dynamic of the situation. <clears throat> the causes and conditions, the gendered inequities of power, and the, the distortions that resulted. So she opened to the whole reality of the situation, seeing clearly, and by seeing clearly and saying, this, this is how it is, she actually felt empowered. And I think this is <clears throat> a very significant um, teaching here. It's getting getting beyond this this binary of sort of victim and and perpetrator, and really standing back <clears throat> and looking very systemically at the whole thing and seeing the causes and conditions and seeing the suffering that's involved for everyone in the in the situation. And really being able to feel <clears throat> empowered by feeling, by seeing so clearly. And this is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have a terrible frog in my throat. If you give me just a moment. <clears throat> That's a great expression, isn't it? A frog in the throat. Quite literal. Uh, so this is pretty much where we, many of us find ourselves today. We're really aware of all the sort of racial and economic just injustice that we're embedded in the, uh, the environmental injustice. We're, we're really anxious about the cause of the pandemic, both its short and long-term effects on our community, our state, our, our nation and our world. And it really seems like there is just so much suffering and, and such a, a challenge. And, um, once again, uh, I really find myself going to, uh, James Baldwin, who has a really famous passage from Notes of a Native Son that I think has been just so helpful in in really articulating the challenge of this moment. And Baldwin says, it began to seem that one would have to hold in the mind forever two ideas which seemed to be in opposition. The first idea was acceptance the acceptance totally without rancor of life as it is and men as they are. In light of this idea, it goes without saying that injustice is a commonplace. But this did not mean that one could be complacent for the second idea was of equal power. One must never in one's own life accept these injustices as commonplace 
but must fight them with all one's strength. The fight begins, however, in the heart, and it has now been laid to my charge to keep my own heart free of hatred and despair. And this is really where we, we find ourselves, I think, today. Um, we find ourselves where there is uh, so much injustice and so much suffering and a need to really see clearly how things have, have come to be. And then to feel that we we need to act and to act with without um, without hatred and despair. And this is really uh, a challenge when we open open to the whole uh, enormity of the difficulties of uh, of our world. And we've talked and Shelley has talked and, and a number of, of us in the community have been you know, talking about the importance of developing um, loving kindness, which is this this really wholesome concern for the welfare of all, and developing compassion, which is you know, seeing uh, seeing suffering and having that beautiful aspiration to alleviate it, and working with equanimity that idea of not falling into extremes, of really being sort of grounded and, and balanced. And I wanted tonight to introduce into that um, that mix um, one of the, the paramis, which are um, called the, the Ten Perfections of the Heart. And one of those uh, loving kindnesses is, is one of those perfections. Compassion is a perfection. But there's a a perfection that's called virya, and it is usually translated again as persistence in the face of difficulty, but it can also be translated as courage. I mean, what is courage but persistence in the face of, of difficulty? And um, I recently watched again um, a program about um, Brian Stevenson. And I don't know if everyone here is familiar with Brian Stevenson. There's a wonderful documentary called Just Mercy, but Do Brian Stevenson has spent his life, the past um, 30, 30 some years um, as an attorney trying to overturn um, unjust death row uh, sentences in Alabama. He has uh, worked with the worst um, prison systems, with the most egregious um, uh, sort of, of um, injustices uh, and has worked uh, tirelessly and has not always been successful um, some of the men he has tried to uh, defend and have their cases reheard, ha have new evidence come in. Some of those men have been executed. Um, Brian Stevenson also was the person who successfully brought to the Supreme Court um, the case that decided that it was um, impermissible to apply the death penalty to children. I mean, isn't that shocking that in our lifetimes, in our recent lifetimes, that the death penalty in the United States could still be um, administered to children, you know, people under 18. And um, Brian Stevenson has also successfully argued that there should be no life without parole for children who are convicted of serious crimes. 
and and this is just um, you know the most uh, heartbreaking uh, work. But when I think about um, you know sort of this idea of, of persistence in the face of difficulty, um, that there's this wonderful story where um, a man was um, convicted of um, of a murder and um, the if I have this have this right he was arrested in Alabama he said he was mowing his lawn was arrested and uh, they wouldn't tell him what he was arrested for they asked if he had a gun he said no but his mother had an old revolver they got her her revolver and the uh, arresting sheriff said you know there are five reasons why you're going to be found guilty. There's going to be a white man who's going to say you're guilty. There's going to be a white lawyer. There's going to be a white judge. There's going to be a white jury. And everyone thinks it's a better day when one more N-word is sent away. And um, after 14 years in prison, Brian Stevenson started working on his case. And after 16 years of working on his case, so he's in prison for 30 years, Brian Stevenson got him out. And he now works with Brian Stevenson. Um, but he just talks about, you know, I mean, there's this incredible um, persistence of being willing for 16 years to work to get this man um off death row and out of prison. Um, so, you know, I mean, we ha- we do have these just um, amazing uh, people in our uh, that we can look to for for real inspiration. Um, recently on the podcast, Ten Percent Happier, which I hope everybody sort of takes a look at. It's a uh, a Buddhist podcast by Dan Harris. Um, he had someone on there who was um, an expert on fear and uh, and altruism. And um, she said, you know, it's not that people kind of get over their fear or they lose their fear. When we study people who act with courage, what we discover is that there's something more important to them than their fear, that they're motivated to protect what they love, to protect what they care about, to act on the principles that they care about. She said, it's not that they're, they have sort of abandoned fear. She said, it's always that there's something that's more important to them. And that's where their attention goes. Their attention goes to what they really really care about and you know we can do that um, not only as individuals as uh, but as a community you know, we can see injustices inequities um, betrayals brutality um, the times just today came out with a report on the draft of the separation of children from their parents um, you know, 18 children under two years old were taken away from their parents by by ICE. Um, nursing children taken away from their mothers. You know, and we can we can persist with whatever our means are to try to work to get these sorts of injustices changed. Um, and <clears throat> we do it. Not by demonizing, not by hating, not by othering, but to real, by really working toward the good, working not with hatred, not, not with despair, but working toward the, toward the good. Um, Angela Davis has a great quote. She says, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, and you have to do it all the time. You have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, and you have to do it 
all the time. And, you know, another great example of this is um, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist teacher, <clears throat> monk, um, who in the, <clears throat> the late 60s and early 70s, left Vietnam to go and try to participate in the Paris peace talks in Vietnam. And he wasn't allowed back in the country. And he developed a mindfulness community. He, <clears throat> he taught, he had these just beautiful, beautiful practices and, you know, really transformed so many people through his mindfulness through his mindful walking. Um, and <clears throat> and right now, um, he is actually transitioning out of this life. He is on his deathbed. And we can just have so much gratitude for, um, for his life and his example. He's in his 90s and he has just been completely committed to walking this, this path of peace. <clears throat> so we have these terrific um, examples of people in, um, in our life who have just um, behaved in this very persistent, clear way, without, without hatred, without despair. Um, you know, the late um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the deep ecologist Joanna Macy, think about Jane Goodall. Um, and you can bring, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you can bring to mind your own um, pantheon of uh, individuals who have persisted with grace and dignity. You know, it may be um, teachers that you've known, it may be family members, relatives, um, but, you know, they've faced these kinds of difficulties with a kind of, of clarity and, and persistence. And as Tanisra says, choosing to face Reality really empowers. And we get to do this as a, a community. And I'd encourage um, anyone who hasn't to go to the Common Ground website and read um, the love letter to the community that a number of us, um, the inspiration came from Io Utunni, and uh, a number of us, quite a few of us, got together in the community and wrote this love letter to the community about moving forward, um, not in despair, not in hate, and really seeing clearly um, what needs to be done. So I'm going to end my uh, remarks with a poem that uh, is a kind of um, aspirational poem. It comes from uh, a Zen teacher named Hogan Bays, and it's called In This Passing Moment. And it's, um, it's really about making a choice to face reality, to face the pain, and to, uh, to be completely present. So in this passing moment, in this passing moment, karma ripens and all things come to be. I vow to choose what is. If there is cost, I choose to pay. If there is need, I choose to give. If there is pain, I choose to feel. If there is sorrow, I choose to grieve. 
when burning, I choose heat. When starving, I choose hunger. When happy, I choose joy. Whom I encounter, I choose to meet. What I shoulder, I choose to bear. When it is my death, I choose to die. Where this takes me, I choose to go. Being with what is, I respond to what is. This life is as real as a dream. The one who knows it cannot be found. And truth is not a thing. Therefore, I vow to choose this Dharma entrance gate. May all the Buddhas and wise ones help me live this vow in the presence of Sangha, in the light of Dhamma, in oneness with the Buddha. May my path to complete enlightenment benefit everyone. So thank you for your very kind attention. And I would be really happy to hear anyone's uh, responses, comments, observations, um, whatever, whatever strikes you. And I really apologize for my raspy and unpleasant voice. Anyone have any sort of a, a response? Feel free to just unmute yourself and jump in. Was a, a regular um, religious resource person going twice a month to um, a maximum security prison. And I've been doing that now for almost two decades. And I just have a real, um, just a, a real um, uh, feeling of affection and, and compassion for uh for so many uh, people who are incarcerated, and um, you know, some of them did did terrible things, and uh, most of them had really difficult um, circumstances. But um, you know, sort of when I meet people, they're middle aged and older, and I don't get to meet very, very many young people, given the facility I go to, which is mostly sort of middle aged and and older people. And I see people who are really trying to live really worthwhile lives and you know, acts of uh, I would say you know, small acts of generosity are just magnified in a, a place like a prison that um, you know, acts of kindness, acts of generosity. And, um, and I see that. I see that among, uh, people. And, uh, Brian Stevenson said, and, and this is, this is so true. None of us should be judged by what we did on the worst day of our lives. None of us should be completely reduced to that. That no one is just a killer. No one is just a liar. And I think that, you know, in our, with great compassion, we can um, see that, uh, that, um, that there are, um, there are reasons why people ended up making the choices they did, doing the acts that they did. And it's, now, we work hard for um, for justice and fairness and equity, um, and we do that with compassion. Um, and uh, really, the, you know, there's that beautiful um, Jewish notion of tikkun alun, you know, sort of restoring the world, repairing the world, and um, you know what what any of us can do to uh, to repair. 
is uh, you know such a such a good act. Um, whatever we can do, when we can forgive, when we can um, support, when we can go beyond our small selves and um, appreciate, um, even just appreciating the struggle of others. Um, and um, that really is our, our practice. That really is seeing how things have come to be, why people who are often really difficult persons, really hard for us to um, to accept, to really understand how they have uh, have come to be the way they are. And, um, you know, we can have um, compassion for that, which is not to uh, agree with or exonerate, but to understand. And it's really that understanding that is, um, that is so important, that really is crucial to our, our awakening. And I think it's crucial to our, um, our repairing the, the world. So anything, anything else anyone would like to contribute? I worked with early on in my practice and doing the meta practice. I was running a small organization and there was a board member there who just, um, I felt like I could do nothing, nothing right. Um, and that no matter what I did, this person criticized it. And so um, I decided on a retreat to work with him as the difficult person. Cause I didn't have to see him that often. So, you know, it was, because when you work with a difficult person, the suggestion is, you know, not to work with the, the most difficult person in your life, but someone who is just kind of, you know, consistently annoying. Um, so I, I started to work with this person. This may be the case you're talking about, Robert. But what I remembered about this person and thinking about this person was that this person really loved his kids, that he was a great dad. And I just really kept calling that to mind as I I did my practice. And I thought, you know, in, in the scheme of things, the fact that he really irritates me um, is just so inconsequential compared to the fact that he just really loves his kids and he's a great dad and he just does all these these wonderful things to raise to really um, happy, loving, loving children. And so, you know, if we can, um, remembering, you know, uh, if, if we can sometimes bring to mind something, or the other thing I do in working with difficult persons um, is sometimes that I, and this may sound a little morbid, but uh, I imagine them on their deathbed being frightened. And I, in, in the uh, 90s, I did some hands-on work with people who were um, dying from, from HIV AIDS. So I witnessed a number of deaths. And um, being with someone who is frightened of dying is, is just really heartbreaking. That is really a heartbreaking experience. And so... When I think of some people that are difficult, I don't know them personally, they're public figures, um, and I think about all the sort of moral injury that they have caused to themselves during their lifetimes. You know, I can imagine that they might be very frightened at the time of death, and I really feel some compassion for that because that's, that's a very, um, it is heartbreaking. So, um, there are ways in which we can use our imagination and our um, our understanding to um, not push those people out of our lives, not to demonize them, um, to understand really flawed, wounded, damaged people, and um, and that really. Um, 
evokes that sense of, of compassion. That's real suffering for people um, that have have the the woundedness that we often see that makes people act in really really unskillful and hurtful ways. So it's just a a way of kind of opening opening the heart and and the mind. Um, and I don't think we should ever. Uh, minimize the sort of moral damage that um, that people do to themselves by acting unskillfully. It's really a ca- cause for remorse and for hurt. And um, and I think it's often the reason why people you know, end up with all sorts of other kinds of compounded unskillful behaviors to get away from that that sense of uh, the harm that they've done. Because I think most of us do have, uh, maybe, I, and again, I'm not a psychologist. My training's in philosophy. I'm not a psychologist. But, you know, with the exception of persons who are uh, understood to be psychopaths, um, most people do have a sense of the harm that they that they have done. They're not oblivious to it. So... I think we can bring compassion to to that. So we could end by sharing the merit, which, as you know from Shelley, is something that I very much like to do it because it it really engages our imagination and our sense of uh, generosity. So. So let's just take a moment and um, reflect that if there's been any goodness to our practice and our efforts, if there are any any benefits that we've um, that we've gained from being together tonight, it's the joy of being in sangha in community tonight sharing our aspirations, sharing this goodness. If there's any benefit, we would gladly, joyfully, happily share that with others, with beings known, teachers, friends, family, or sangha members, and beings unknown. We can imagine all over the world there are people like us wanting to do good. And there are people who would want to do good if their circumstances were different. So let's just embrace it in our hearts. All those people, all those beings, and extend that goodness to the four-leggeds and the wingeds, wishing for all beings. May they live with ease. May they live without oppression. And you can tonight think of any, anyone you would especially like to share the merit with anyone who's been a target of injustice, any group of persons who've suffered. The people in ICE detention and the detainers. We would share whatever benefit we have with them in the hopes that all can come to know ease and peace and freedom. So thank you for your sincere practice. And um, Shelley should be here next week. Good night, everybody.